welcome to General Conference Conversations, where we have conversations about General Conference. I'm your host, Kaylin, and I'm super excited to be here with you studying the words of Christ's chosen leaders. I hope you enjoy. Hello, hello. Welcome back to another episode of General Conference Conversations. Um, I'm very excited for this talk. I have a lot to say about it <laughs> and it's one of my favorite topics about personal revelation so um the talk is a framework for personal revelation uh by elder renland and it's um let's see the fourth talk in a saturday morning session and this was honestly one of my favorite talks there are a couple, a couple of things that i'll talk about a little bit later that i um, I had prob I, I was had problems with it because it's literally the impossible uh, speaking. But there were a couple of things that I thought about as I was reading this that I, I want to share, and maybe you haven't thought about before. But before I start, of course, as usual, um, I encourage you to listen to or read this talk before you come and listen to me ramble about it for the next half an hour, um, and get your own your own personal revelation about personal revelation <laughs> and your own questions and direction on what to study and what to work on. Um, and hopefully some of the questions that I ask today or the things that I talk about will help maybe, um, will maybe jog stuff for you or um, make you think about things in the way that's that maybe you haven't before. So I'm gonna go ahead and jump right in. So, like I said, this is by Elder Renland. He starts out, and this, this made me really happy, and I know a lot of, it was a big like moment for people because he uses a um, plain analogy. And that's his first, his first paragraph is, like many of you, I have been greatly influenced by Elder Dieter F. Uchtdorf over the years. That explains, at least in part, about what, I, what I'm about to say. So, with apologies to him, and then he goes into um, a plain analogy. <laughs> um, about pilots operating within a framework. Uh, that they are brilliant and talented and, you know, work really hard to learn to become pilots. But they have to have a framework. They have to have something that they, you know, they have to use the right runways and they have to pay attention to the air traffic controllers and the people who are waving them the right way. And like, they have to work within a framework. So he is kind of, it, this starts his whole thesis. He says, after baptism, we are given a majestic yet practical gift, the gift of the Holy Ghost. As we strive to stay on the covenant path, it is the Holy Ghost that will show us all things that we should do. When we are unsure or uneasy, we can ask God for help. The Savior's promise could not be clearer. Ask and it shall be given to you, for every one that asketh receiveth. With the help of the Holy Ghost, we can transform our divine nature into our eternal destiny. So... And then he goes on to talk about the framework that the Holy Ghost works in because there are rules, right? There are certain things that that we kind of all know about personal revelation and he kind of lays it out. He uses elements of framework of kind of, because they're not all rules, they're like, their rules and also suggestions. I don't know how to explain it. I like the I liked his use of like elements in f of the framework of personal revelation. So, so he has four of them. So I'm gonna go through all four and talk about them individually. So the first one is scriptures. Um, he quotes Robert D. Hales and says. Elder Robert D. Hill said, when we want to speak to God, we pray, and we want him to speak to us, we search the scriptures. That is very true in my life. I know that's not usually, not, not always true for everybody. Um, 
some people have a really hard time reading scriptures but but also like any words of christ right like also down conference talks as we're doing here and um and things like that but i know some people are really really struggle with reading the scriptures or um Like getting personal relation from the scriptures it doesn't always happen for everybody but that's definitely been a big thing for me personally um even before i've read the scriptures regularly which i still struggle to read the scriptures regularly but like before my mission especially when i was in high school um i had a lot of experiences and i know this isn't like i said isn't doesn't happen for everybody i had a couple of experiences where i would open the scriptures just randomly because I didn't know my scriptures, I would at least open them. And I would open them to a random page. And there was one experience in particular that I remember. That I opened it, I was having a very, very bad day. Um, it was a really rough point in my life <laughs> for a lot of reasons. And I had come home and I was crying, just like sobbing in my bedroom. And I opened Doctrine and Covenants and I still, to this day, I don't remember where I turned to. I tried to like find it again, um, but I don't remember what it said. It was something reassuring. I know that it was something like, you know, God has you in the palm of his hand. He is watching out for you. He is something, right? And I knew in that moment, I felt in that moment that God was watching over me and my family. My family was also, it was, it was a really rough time for my whole family. And I had a couple of experiences like that where I would open to kind of a random spot and find a lot of comfort there. And then when I, but I wasn't good at writing my scriptures. I couldn't, I love reading. I loved reading since I was little. My mom read to us every night when I was little and I was a bookworm. I'm still a bookworm. I love reading. I love consuming knowledge, but scriptures just didn't do it for me. Like I could not get into reading the Book of Mormon or the Bible, or the Doctrine and Covenants. So I never really got in that habit. And then I became a missionary. And I'll talk about this more in a couple of uh, a couple of episodes because Elder Rasband gave a talk about the Book of Mormon. And my experience with the Book of Mormon really fits in that talk better. But I learned to really love the scriptures. I learned to get lost in the scriptures and I got lost in the scriptures for an hour every single day and I found a lot of comfort even if it wasn't just the like there were some times where it was literally the words on the page um there was one point I think I've told this story before because I have a limited number of stories but there is this one point where I was on my mission it was a very low point of my mission and I had been uh, emergency transferred because I had broken mission rule and I was with a new companion and the next day we had a mission-wide conference and looking back there was probably no way that news of me being ET'd uh, had made it all the way across the mission but it was a very small mission and rumors traveled quickly and news traveled fast and so in my brain my anxious anxiety riddled brain of mine especially at the time when i was very vulnerable mentally um i thought that everybody was just gonna stare at me i thought that everybody was gonna know and that people were gonna whisper and i was just terrified to go to this mission because all the mission the whole mission was gonna be there all the missionaries and so that morning during my personal study i was reading the book of mormon and there was it was in the chapter heading it wasn't even in the scriptures itself it said something like i will burn your enemies to rubble or something like that and i just sat there and i laughed and i was like heavenly father i don't need you to burn them to rubble but like thank you for getting my attention and thank you for reminding me that you're going to protect me and it sounds really silly right it sounds really funny but but my anxiety at that time, nothing was getting through to me. And so God knew that I needed to laugh. 
he needed he knew i needed to laugh he knew I, he needed to say something completely ridiculous and silly for me to pay attention and i did and i felt so much better i was still nervous but he did protect me nobody said anything to me during that conference except for the people who already knew people that i trusted and respected that i like former companions of mine that talked to me and were like are you okay <laughs> like not like hey what happened i want all the gossip <laughs> So anyway, so personally for me, <laughs> scripture is definitely a big deal. And of course it makes sense, right? That these are the literal words of God. Um, and, and like I said, even if it's not, sometimes it is literally the words on the page for me. And sometimes I'll be reading it and I'm in the mindset. I've put myself in the mindset to listen to God. You know, I'll ask a question before I sit down and study and be like, this is what I'm really, like, really worried about today. And even if it's nothing to do on the page, like I'll be reading about war in Alma and I'll get a message of love in the back of my head of like, mm. and I get kind of a splash of inspiration or a nudge in the right direction. Um, but, but, but opening up that communication line between you and God is really important. And scriptures are a great way to do that. So... Because Annie, Annie points out, they teach us how to re receive spiritual personal revelation also. Um, like they they literally are the word of God, but they also teach us how to. They give us um, examples of people who literally are writing down their, their personal revelation for us. The scriptures are their interactions with God. They are the the ways that they have, that have heard from the Lord. And I think it's it's important when we are reading the scriptures to remember that like, oh, thus saith the Lord. And when I was little and still sometimes I'll be like, oh, like they're literally speaking to the Lord. I've never done that. I've never stood face to face with the Lord. And some of them definitely stood face to face with the Lord and had conversations with him. But they're also describing just their personal revelation. They are getting answers as prophets, which obviously is different than us. We're not prophets, which we'll talk about in a second, but they are describing the ways that their personal revelation came to them, basically, uh, which I think is, is really cool to see Nephi get personal revelation, have conversations with the Lord through the Holy Ghost. So that brings us to the second element, um, is that we receive personal revelation only within our purview and not within the prerogative of others, which is what I was talking about, right? We are not prophets. I'm not the prophet of the church. So my personal revelation is going to look very different than Elma's. My personal revelation is going to look very different than President Nelson's. Um, because I'm not getting personal revelation for the entire world. That's just... That's not my purview. That is not my prerogative. And so he uses um, his airplane method analogy. Method? Pff, words are hard. His airplane analogy, again, about landing on our appointed runway and like doing our appointed jobs. Um, and he tells a story about, well, he talks about... Um, one of the eight witnesses in the book of, of the Book of Mormon in the early church claimed to be receiving revelations for the whole church. And in Doctrine and Covenants 28, the Lord spoke to Joseph and was like, um, no, I'm the only person that's going to receive commandments for the whole church from me is my is is Joseph Smith and anybody else that I appoint in his stead. So like any other prophets that I call. And so, and then he tells a story about his own experience. Um, there was a guy who had gotten arrested for trespassing. He called up Elder Renlund and he said, I was trespassing because it was revealed to me that additional scripture was buried under this building that I was trespassing on, the land of this building I was trespassing on. And that once he obtained that that additional scripture, um, that he would receive the gift of translation 
and be able to bring forth the new scripture for the whole church. And <laughs> Elder Renlund's like, no, no, that's not right. You, whatever. And he's like, and he asked me to pray about it. And I said, no, because like, I didn't need to because he would not be receiving revelation for the whole church because he's not the prophet. That's not the pattern. That's not how God deals with people on the earth. He uses the word or the phrase contrary to the economy of God, uh, which I think it comes from the teachings of the presence of the church, Joseph Smith. <clears throat> but I just love that like one line, like I said last time, there are lines that just stick into my brain as a contrary to the economy of God. God works in certain ways. So he says this personal revelation rightly belongs to individuals. You can receive revelation, for example, about where to live, what career path to follow or follow or whom to marry. Church leaders may teach doctrine and share inspired counsel. But the responsibility for these decisions rests with you. That is your revelation to receive. It is your runway. So I love that. I love, I love the uh, reminder that obviously that is a big thing, right? If you get a prompting to be like, oh, go tell this person that they should do this with their lives. Like you're not going to get personal revelation for somebody else in your life. You can share inspired counsel, um, especially if you are in a specific calling. You have the, the opportunity to receive counsel for what you should do to try and help those that you serve. Um, so like as a primary teacher, I can, I can receive personal revelation for how I should structure a lesson or things that I should specifically talk about, questions I should specifically ask to help tailor it to the kids in my class. But I'm not going to get personal revelation for the girl sitting in my class to tell her what to do. That's not how it works. Same thing as like a parent. You can get personal revelation about how you should help your child, how you should try to help your children, um, counsel and guide and things like that, but they are going to get their own personal revelation. They have their own agency. So I just, that whole quote was just really good. Uh, and also just reminding us of the power that we have of personal revelation, that church leaders are going to talk, teach doctrine and share inspired counsel but the responsibility to follow that counsel and the responsibility to figure out how that counsel works within your life um, rests between you and the Lord. That's that's your runway. That's your area of expertise to, to have counsel with, with God himself. The third element is pretty straightforward that um, personal relations is going to be within harmony of like church doctrine and commandments. Oh, I'm sorry, he doesn't say church doctrine. He says commandments of God and the covenants we have made with him. So, which makes sense, right? God's not going to go and tell you to kill somebody. And he does bring that up. He brings up um, Nephi. <clears throat> and he's like, okay, yes, there's no simple explanation for this. There's no, like, Nephi himself is not standing in front of us. God himself is not standing in front of us and telling us this is what happened that day. This is why. But he does point out, he's like, Nephi didn't come to the Lord asking if he could kill Laban. The Lord said it. And if I was like, um, no, that's against the commandments and also against my own personal moral code. And like, I'm not going to kill somebody. And the Lord said, no, this is, you know, this is the reason why. And it did become a commandment of the Lord. <clears throat> but a broad general rule is that God's not going to like tell you to cheat on your husband or something like that. Right. The fourth one is that we need to recognize what God has already revealed to us. 
while being open for personal, further personal revelation from him. So this is the part that I had a little bit of trouble with for me personally and, and maybe in me sharing my struggles with this and things that I've thought about and prayed about and studied about, maybe it will help you. So he starts out by saying, if God has changed a question, ah, sorry, hmm. if God has answered a question and the circumstances have not changed, why would we expect the answer to be different? I have a hard time with this question because I have friend, a friend who was planning on going on a mission and they prepared and prepared and did all of their paperwork and interviews and all that stuff the whole time they felt really good about going on a mission and they were still like checking in being like hey am i still on the right path is this still the right thing for me and it got to be where it was the only thing they had left was like a medical the one thing to do left and they again were just like checking in and being like hey checking in is this still what i'm supposed to do and god was like actually i think you're good you don't need to go on a mission. Obviously, that was not my experience. And so I'm not speaking for my friend. Um, but that was a, a experience, an example of where the answer did change. The answer was different. And maybe that, that fits into the circumstances changed, right? She was different. She had fulfilled some of what God wanted her to do. And so maybe that was like circumstances changed. I have no idea. I don't know, but there are definitely things and he talks about this later. And so I'm not, not dumping on Elder Renland, obviously, but this whole thing kind of just, made me think a lot. And this is why. So he talks about Martin Harris and Joseph Smith talking to the Lord about giving him the 116 manuscript pages, right? Mm. So he asks once, the Lord says no. He asks again, the Lord says no. Martin's like, please ask again. Third time, the Lord's like, you know my will, but do whatever you want. Like, you have the agency. And I think that was a very specific set of circumstances, for one. Also, like with my friend, she wasn't asking over and over and over to do something that the Lord had said no to. So I think that's that specific example is like, obviously I'm not gonna be like, God, can I please kill this person? Can I please kill this person? Please, can I kill this person? And then expect to get a yes, right? No, that's not how it works. But, but I have, I have other thoughts. So I'm going to read this, this last, this other quote. Um, he says, oh, and the footnote that goes along with it, because I think the footnote is important. So he says, if we have received personal revelation for our situation and the circumstances have not changed, God has already answered our question. For example, we sometimes, sometimes ask repeatedly for assurance that we have been forgiven. If we have repented, then have been filled with joy and peace of conscience and received a remission of our sins, we do not need to ask again, but can trust the answer God has already given. And this footnote's really interesting on this. I, I mentioned this for a couple of the other talks as well. To pay attention to the footnotes, because sometimes they add things, not just like references to scriptures and stuff and other talks, but actual like whole paragraphs. He says, see Mosiah 4, 3, which is one of the, the is a, a thing. He says, when we continue to feel guilt and regret after sincere and intentional repentance, it is usually because of a lack of faith in Jesus Christ and in his ability to completely forgive and heal us. Sometimes we believe forgiveness is for others, but does not completely apply to us. That is simply a lack of faith in what the Savior can accomplish because of his infinite atonement. And that's footnote 28, by the way. You're trying to find that. <laughs> footnote 28. <clears throat> so I have a personal experience with this. Not specifically with um, repentance, although that is something that my anxiety likes to toy with me with. I have anxiety. 
And so my brain likes to convince me that I'm doing everything wrong. And often I find myself asking God again, hey, did you actually answer yes to this? Did you actually tell me to do this? Am I actually on the right path? Because my brain likes to convince me <laughs> that I'm not, or that I imagined it, that whatever God was telling me was my own brain, was my own wishful thinking, sort of. And I had an experience years ago, right before I went on my mission, I was at a come follow me discussion with some other YSAs in my ward. And we were talking about the New Testament. And I don't remember what we were talking about, but... Oh, I think we were talking about Mary, Mary the mother of Jesus. And the difference between questions, because she asks questions, she's like, you know, the Lord, the, an, the angel comes to her and says, hey, you're going to be the, the you're going to bear the, 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 the son of God. He's going to, he's going to come out of your womb. And she's like, how's that going to work? Because, um, I'm not married. <laughs> and like, I know no man. And I, I pretty sure that needs to happen first before you get pregnant. And we are comparing that with a question by somebody later on that was more of a doubting question of like, yeah, right, whatever. And so we were, just, we were talking about intention, basically is what it came down to, was if the intention of your, if the intention of your question is to actually, like you are literally doubting, consciously doubting the power of God, you're doubting him, you're doubting his power, that's different than um, I've kind of like am wishy-washy in my brain right now and I need assurance. And I had written down, because I was taking notes, I had written down like, so does God, am I bugging him when I ask him over and over about a revelation that I've gotten in the past? Or like, does he want me to not ask that? And I had just this overwhelming feeling of like, no, duh, he wants to hear from you. He is going to lovingly remind you every time that you ask that he is there, that he does love you, that he did tell you those things or he didn't tell you those things, right? He's going to confirm that for you. Like he's going to answer. You're not bugging him because he's your, you are his child, you're his daughter and he wants to hear from you. And so I think what President Ren or President Renland, well, Elder Renland is saying, like there is some faith that comes to that, right? Like when you fully repent, you have to have the trust that you have fully repented and and rely on that knowledge and that experience that you had in your repenting process. But I also think we are human, right? We are going to have doubt, we are going to have fear we are gonna doubt ourselves sometimes and we're gonna doubt that something actually happens because our memories are not permanent and so keeping that line of communication open with god is really really important and he goes on to say that and i really liked what he said later just the next paragraph he says even as we trust god's prior answers we need to be open to personal for the revelation sorry We need to be open to further personal revelation. Wow. <clears throat> and and so it's it, it felt this this is why this part was kind of wishy washy and hard for me because it felt like he was kind of contradicting himself. And reading through it and like thinking about it and studying about it, um, I get where he's coming from, right? But, but this is kind of what, what cleared it up for me. And also something I've thought about before, that we do still need to be open to further personal revelation, right? So we ask a question we, and we get an answer. Sometimes that's just step one. Now we need to be open to further like direction of how we should accomplish step one or we should accomplish this goal. And I've definitely done this in my life where I have 
I've got an answer and I've gotten direction and I just go for it. And it turns out awful. And I'm like, God, you told me this is supposed to like be a thing that helps. And he's like, yeah, but you didn't listen. You didn't keep listening. There were more things. There were things that maybe you didn't think that you should have done or you didn't think about that I would have been like, hmm, maybe this is a thing. And I was like, oh. And sometimes he does say, just figure it out. Like, this is a good thing. Both of these are good options. I trust your agency, right? There are definitely times, like we talked about with um, with Elder Oaks' talk, or President Oaks' talk, <clears throat> that we should not be guided in all things, right? Like, there are some things that we just need to take initiative. Like, we're doing good, we're going to do good. But we also do need to... As, pres as, as um, Elder Renlund says, personal revelation is sometimes received line upon line and precept upon precept. And he says, few of life's de destinations are right reached via a nonstop flight. Right? Sometimes, <laughs> a lot of times we have layovers and we have things that, little other goals and directions that we need to get to the final destination that he's given us. And sometimes that can be really frustrating. My husband and I have a lot of goals and plans and a lot of things that we've gone to the Lord. And he's like, yeah, that's good. And we're like, okay, cool. How do we get there? And our life right now looks a lot different than we were expecting our life to look a year ago because we were expecting to be at this specific spot. And we've taken a detour. We've taken a layover. <laughs> we are in a place that we didn't think we were going to be in. And, but it works. We know that we're supposed to be here. So, so my questions for you don't have a specific quote to go with them. It's kind of the whole, this whole talk, this whole framework that he's been talking about. How can you use these four elements to seek personal revelation in your life? And how has the spirit spoken to you in the past? And how does the spirit speak to you now? I think that's really important to know. Um, it was a big topic on my mission. It's been a big topic from President Nelson for the last five years. Um, his whole Hear Him initiative, right? Hearing from apostles and uh, organization leaders <clears throat> on social media. This is how I hear him. This is how the Lord speaks to me. Uh, is really important because, like I said at the beginning, not everybody gets personal revelation only, for, only through scripture. Some people get it through music, through books, through other people. Um, I get it a lot of times through writing. I get it with an actual voice in my head, which doesn't happen very often, but sometimes it does and it's really cool. And sometimes I get it as I'm giving service to other people or as I'm comforting somebody else. And I'm like, oh, that wasn't me. That was the spirit and I needed that too. And so I think it's really, really important to know and to figure out and pay attention to how the Lord speaks to you. Um, it's not always a warm, fuzzy feeling in your heart. Sometimes it is, but sometimes it's going to come through something that you weren't expecting. Um, and that's the other thing, it might change. As I've learned and grown, my personal revelation has changed it, has, has changed it. What? has changed, has shifted to new things because I'm, I'm learning new things. I've been learning the piano. And so I have gotten into the habit of sitting down at the piano when I'm really stressed and it helps me to emotionally release. And then I am able to like get comfort from the Lord. And I, a lot of times I end up playing church music. And so that helps as well. And so but that wasn't something that I like, I didn't get personal relation through playing the piano 12 years ago when I was actually taking piano lessons as, you know, a seven year old. Um, that wasn't 10 years ago. That was like 15 years ago. Wow. Um, 18 years ago. Anyway, I can't do math. But I think it's also important to see to see how you have throughout your life. Maybe it's not really that you get personal revelation that way anymore, or you still do, and there are new ways that the Lord speaks to you. Um, but to pay attention to all that and to notice the patterns and see that in your life. And then also 
to use these four elements, to think about how those four elements have have affected you in the past and have um, played into how the spirit has spoken to you and personal relation that you've gotten. And then to use them going forward. I think that's super important. So, so those are my two questions for you. The, if you're looking for further reading <laughs> or to further study, oh, I don't have anything written down. That's awkward. That's really awkward. That first quote that I read you uh, is three paragraphs in, and there are a bunch of footnotes. It's footnotes two through seven. Um, I swear I wrote down actual further reading. <laughs> Let's see if I can find it. <laughs> but I will say footnotes two through seven because that's that's a lot of footnotes in one paragraph. Uh, he quotes a lot of scriptures, obviously most of them are scriptures. Um, but it's all about the Holy Ghost and the gift of the Holy Ghost. So if that's something that you would want to further study, um, um, there's a lot of good starting points in there. Um, I swear I really had more. So let me see if I can find them. I wrote them, probably wrote them down somewhere else. <clears throat> Here we go. Oh yes, so there is a talk. Oh, the quote from Robert D. Hales comes from a talk that he gave in October 2006. Holy Scriptures, the power of God unto our salvation, which sounds really cool. I haven't read it, but I'm so sorry if you can hear that weird tapping. We're running the dishwasher and I'm in the basement and so it makes really weird noises when it's... Anyway. So that's a good one. I'm sure that would be a good one about, about more about scriptures specifically because um, he doesn't elaborate a whole lot in his talk about scriptures. And then I have talks and scriptures listed in a footnote 10. Oh yes, more about scriptures. He has, oh yes, that's right. He has like a whole bunch. My goodness. Um, he says, the scriptures teach us, teach that the voice of the Holy Ghost is mild and still like a whisper, not loud or noisy. It is simple, quiet, and plain. It can be piercing and burning. It affects both mind and heart. It brings peace, joy, and hope, not fear, anxiety, and worry. It invites us to do good and not evil. And it is enlightening and delicious, not mystifying, which that that's also just really cool. But then he lists oh, so many. First Kings, Omni, Alma, Helaman, Third Nephi, Moroni, Doctrine and Covenants. And then he's got one, two, three, four. Four talks. I think three of those are President Nelson, which as I was talking about earlier, he's been he's been talking about personal relation since he became prophet, right? So there are four talks that are referenced um, in there that are specifically, again, tied to scriptures specifically. So if you're looking for more study about scriptures, and also uh, I encourage you to look at all the footnotes in this talk if that's something that um, you, if there's more things that you want to learn. So that's really all I've got, to do, got for you today, but I'll see you on Friday. And um, I hope that this helped to help you think a little bit about your own personal relation and all of that jazz. So, thank you so much for listening to and or watching <laughs> this episode of General Conference Conversations. Be sure to like and follow and share us on Facebook and Instagram. And if you like the show, please subscribe or leave a review and tell your friends and family. Also, a quick reminder that there is a physical study guide to go along with these videos. Uh, you can find that link in the description. Until next time.